In chapter 22, we'll discuss nutrition and eating disorders. So to give you a little bit of a background and some definitions, so eating disorders are considered, again, this is a psychiatric illness characterized by a persistent disturbance of eating habits or weight control behaviors that result in significantly impaired physical health and psychosocial functioning. And so the big three that we'll kind of talk about are going to be anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. So looking at our diagnostic criteria, again, remember that nutrition is going to be ancillary care and treating the symptoms, as again, this is considered a psychiatric illness. And so the American Psychiatric Association does have a set of diagnostic criteria. And this, this is done using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and this is the fifth edition. And so the DSM-5 did replace the DSM-4 in 2013. Um, but the DSM, there's actually some significant changes from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5. So looking at our definitions, and again, so this is the, when you see the textbook definition, so then we'll kind of talk about that and explain them. So for anorexia nervosa, so eating disorder diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa includes restriction of energy intake relative to requirements, leading to significantly low body weight in the context of age, sex, developmental trajectory, and physical health. And significantly low weight is defined as weight that is less than minimally normal, or for children and adolescents, less than minimally expected. There's also intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, or persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain, even though significantly low weight. And three, disturbance in the way in which one's body weight or shape is experienced, undue influence of body weight of shape on self-evaluation or persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of the current low body weight. And so again, remembering that this comes from the, right, the American Psychiatric Association is that again, it's not just being skinny, right? There's, there's more to this process. Now, anorexia nervosa does have two subtypes, and this is probably one of the more confusing aspects. So when you think of anorexia nervosa in your head or in pop culture, what you're probably thinking of is the restricting type. And so during the current episode of anorexia nervosa, the person has not regularly engaged in binge eating or purging behavior, such as self-induced vomiting or misuse of laxatives, diuretics, or enemas. But there's also a second subtype. And again, this is the difference in pop culture versus real life. And so this is the binge eating purging type. So during the current episode of anorexia nervosa, the person has regularly engaged in binge eating or purging behavior. And again, because of pop culture, most people associate binge eating and purging behaviors with bulimia nervosa. Um, but again, a patient experiencing anorexia nervosa can also exhibit those symptoms, right? And that's a specific subtype. Now looking at the prevalence of anorexia nervosa, so estimated to be somewhere between 0.3 to 3.7% of women. And so again, the problem, I know it's a very, very large range, but again, it has to also be detected, reported, treated, etc. So again, sometimes it can go undiagnosed or for long periods of time. Again, that's why you'll see large variance in the estimates. Estimated to be about 0.3% in men. Initial presentation is, is usually during adolescence or young adulthood. And again, it's a combination of genetic, environmental, and psychosocial factors with a mortality rate of 2.8%, with 50% of deaths that are attributed to medical complications directly related to anorexia nervosa. Um, and so again, this is considered right, the deadliest psychiatric illness. So again, while other illnesses may impair quality of life, et cetera, Right, anorexia nervosa right, does have, again, compared to other psychiatric illnesses, a very high mortality rate. So psychological and psychiatric features associated with anorexia nervosa. Now, again, this is not a checklist of, oh, if people have this, they're going to get anorexia nervosa, right? That's not how associations work. But again, this is the typical patient or what we often see, including perfectionism, compulsivity, a harm avoidance personality with excessive worrying, pessimism, or shyness, feelings of ineffectiveness, 
inflexible thinking, overly restrained emotional expression, limited social spontaneity, depression in somewhere between 50 to 75% of patients, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder in 40% of patients, personality disorders, and substance abuse. Now here we can see some physical and diagnostic findings in patients with anorexia nervosa. So again, you're seeing the physical or biochemical signs such as dry skin, lanugo, alopecia, slowed heart rate, low blood pressure, changes in gastric emptying or constipation, and changes in serum lab values. Now again, we are not medical doctors and we are definitely not psychiatrists, right, which is a specialty within being a medical doctor. So again, even if you've been doing this for 20 years and you've only worked with eating disorder clients, right, it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, but you are not legally able to make that diagnosis. But instead with our PES statements, right, what we're focused on is specific behaviors that we can treat in addition to or supporting the efforts of the rest of the interdisciplinary team. So for example, disordered eating pattern related to complaints of being too fat, so that's patient statements, as evidenced by current weight of 82 pounds and self-limited dietary intake of 450 calories per day. So again, this is very clearly unhealthy behaviors, but again, I'm not going outside of my scope of practice and making a diagnosis I'm not legally allowed to. Another example, inadequate oral food and beverage intake related to refusal to consume more than 450 calories per day as evidenced by a BMI of 15.5. Again, I'm clearly stating the patient's not eating enough. Why? They refuse to eat more than 450. My proof, right, they have a low BMI or a low body weight. Again, I'm not making a diagnosis I'm not qualified to make. I'm focusing on the behaviors. Looking at bulimia nervosa, so again, we have our eating disorder diagnostic criteria from the DSM-5, and so we see recurring episodes of binge eating, which is defined as eating within a two-hour period of time, an amount of food larger than most people would eat during the similar time period, and a sense of lack of control over eating during the episode. So again, uh, for example, if you have just one uh, we think of like teenagers or we think of young people and they've just won a sporting event and then we go out to eat and we consume large amounts of food and we celebrate right we're eating more food than normal but that's not binge eating right so again there, there's some specific criteria so this is not you know if you go to the end zone on thursdays for the wing special and you go in there with the mindset of like i'm going to get my money's worth and eat a very large amount of wings again that may not be healthy for your body, but that's not binge eating, right? Because we're not having that lack of control, right? There's more psychological aspects to it than just eating a lot of food. The second part of the criteria, so we're looking at, so recurring inappropriate compensatory behavior in order to prevent weight gain, including self-induced vomiting, laxatives, diuretics, enemas, excessive exercise, or fasting. And then there's some other criteria. So binge eating and inappropriate compensatory behavior both occur at least once per week for three months. And so these timelines will make sense and why they're important for other diagnostic criteria later. And self-evaluation is unduly influenced by body shape and weight. And number five, the disturbance does not occur exclusively during episodes of anorexia nervosa. And all that saying is, is that Bulimia nervosa is a separate diagnosis from the anorexia nervosa subtype. So if somebody has anorexia nervosa binging and purging subtype, they don't just automatically add on a bulimia nervosa diagnosis. These are two separate diagnoses with different clinical features. Looking at the prevalence of bulimia nervosa, Estimated between somewhere to 1% to 3% of young adult women in the U.S. Rate of occurrence in men is estimated to be one-tenth of that in women. So again, that would be that 0.3-ish percent. Bulimia nervosa patients are typically within the normal rate range, which again makes 
diagnosis and detection more difficult, with a lower mortality rate of 0.4%. Now again, the predominant feature, and so again, what you typically see in pop culture is the binge eating. So again, consumption of an unusually large amount of food, approximately 1,000 to 2,000 calories in a discrete period of time, but again, also that lack of control. For example, the burritos at Moe's are over 1,000 calories. But again, if people are failing to, to finish their burrito, if they're able to stop themselves from eating more, right, again, this is different than binge eating. Now here we can see the physical and diagnostic findings in patients with bulimia nervosa. So again, we have the physical signs, and so we'll talk about so Russell's signs, which is calluses on the back of the knuckles from self-induced vomiting. Cardiovascular symptoms, so we'll talk about, for example, cardiomyopathy from excessive use of syrup of Ipecac. Gastrointestinal issues such as loss of dental enamel, esophagitis, GERD, possibly even tearing of the esophagus. And again, changes in lab values including alkalosis, hypochloremia, hypokalemia, or hyponatremia. Now again, even if you've been working with eating disorder clients for 20 years, looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, we are not qualified to make psychiatric diagnoses. But again, what we're looking at is symptoms. So an example PES statement, excessive oral food and beverage intake related to binge episodes as evidenced by a food diary and intake records showing emotional binges when under stress. So again, I can say that people are eating large amounts of food in a short period of time, but I have not made any statements about right um, their psychological features, right, or I've not tried to diagnose them with something that's outside of my scope of practice. Now looking at binge eating disorder. So binge eating disorder defined as an uncontrolled binge eating without emesis or laxative abuse or no compensatory behaviors are used. So it's often associated with obesity symptoms with 15 to 50% of patients being overweight. So what that tells you though is there are patients that have normal body weights that still have unhealthy behaviors and habits. So they're eating excessively large amounts of food even though they may have normal body weights. This affects approximately 5% of adults in the US at some point in their lifetime so again, because these are psychiatric illnesses, right, that means they're transient. So again, sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't, right, et cetera. Now, they may require ongoing treatment, but again, they may have an acute exacerbation, they may be in remission, right? But again, this is a little bit different than when we talk about some personality disorders um, that are in essence are permanent or not transient. So looking at our diagnostic criteria for binge eating disorder. So recurrent episodes of binge eating characterized by both of the following. So eating in a discrete period of time, two, usually two hours, an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat in a similar period of time, and a sense of lack of control over eating during the episode. The binge eating episodes are associated with three or more of the following. Eating much more rapidly than normal. Eating until feeling uncomfortably full. Eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry. Eating alone because of feeling embarrassed by how much one is eating. And feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed, or very guilty afterwards. So again, going back to the example when people think of this is not just eating a large amount of food. For example, when people enter or when uh, I'm usually thinking of young men, so football players after high school football, right? And they engage in these um, macho manliness contests of how much food can one eat, right? And the person brags about eating 50 wings. Again, while still not a healthy behavior, right? That's not embarrassed. They don't feel guilty. They probably were hungry after practice. Again, there's more components to this than just eating a lot of food. So there's marked distress regarding binge eating. So again, they don't like that they're doing it. The binge, occur, the binge eating occurs on average at least once a week for three months. And again, similar to our previous exclusionary criteria, 
The binge eating is not associated with the recurrent use of inappropriate compensatory behavior, as in bulimia nervosa, and does not occur exclusively during the course of bulimia nervosa or anorexia nervosa, which is if somebody has anorexia nervosa and has the binging and purging subtype, again, they don't just automatically get tacked on a binge eating disorder, right? These are separate disorders. So looking at other eating disorders, so most individuals will meet the criteria for either anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, or binge eating disorder. But some may fall outside of these categories and are known as other specified and unspecified feeding and eating disorders, aka OSFED. Now this is really the biggest change from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 is previously, you might be familiar with the terminology EDNOS, which is eating disorder not otherwise specified. So again, though, this is the category of and everybody else. Now, the idea is that the number of other eating disorders should be minimal now with the refinement of the DSM-5 criteria. So the purpose is, is that if we can clearly define the symptomology of anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder, we clearly define the symptomology, we clearly define treatment plans, we identify best treatment plans and execute them consistently. So now again, I'm just making this up because I am not a psychiatrist or an expert, but let's just say the best treatment plan for binge eating disorder is CBT, an SSRI inhibitor, group therapy, and blank. What happens is, is that we, we clearly define specific behaviors, people are given the correct diagnosis, and then we execute this treatment plan and we know that this treatment plan works 90% of the time. And that's our goal is to find consistent treatment plans that work for these specific disorders. So they kind of want to put people in these specific boxes. So looking at long-term treatment plans and consistency. Um, but again, that does mean that there are some patients that will not meet that symptom criteria. So looking at our OSFED or other specified and unspecified feeding and eating disorders, Examples are things like atypical anorexia nervosa, in which case, so um, this may just be diagnosed early where their weight is not below normal, but they still have the psychological features, right? That intense fear of weight gain, this um, abnormal experience or perception of their body weight, but again, they're not below normal weight. It may be things like bulimia nervosa, but again, we looked at how frequently those episodes had to occur. Same with binge eating disorder. So again, looking at the frequency, if we don't necessarily meet the frequency threshold, those are still abnormal, unhealthy behaviors. There could be purging disorders. So for example, purging without binge eating, only having an intake of a normal amount of food. And as we discussed previously, so night eating syndrome. So again, excessive nighttime food consumption that was more than 25% of your daily caloric intake occurring after the evening meal accompanied by amnesia, right, or so unable to recall these incidences. Now looking at eating disorders in childhood, so the onset of eating disorders typically occurs during adolescence and young adulthood, and it's difficult to diagnose as the clinical presentation may differ in children than in adults. There may be complaints though of nausea, abdominal pain, and difficulty swallowing, along with concerns about weight, shape, and body fatness. An early onset anorexia nervosa may result in delayed or stunted growth, osteopenia or osteoporosis. And again, this is kind of our big concern is that, especially now with the amount of media consumption with Instagram models, quote unquote, uh, with Facebook, um, again, with the ease of Photoshop is that we're seeing, so anorexia nervosa has been reported in patients as young as seven years of age. So again, we're, we're already having this undue influence because of this increased exposure. So the treatment approach, so again, a multidisciplinary approach is required, including psychiatric, which again, is gonna be focused mostly on pharmacology, psychological, looking at counseling, medical, as we saw all of the symptoms, right? The physiological symptoms from this disorder, as well as nutrition. And so the treatment types, um, again, so you have inpatient hospitalization, which is going to be in, for example, a behavioral health unit, so in a psychiatric or medical unit, there's residential treatment programs where you uh, stay at the facility, day hospitalization, intensive outpatient treatment, and then 
outpatient treatment, which is going to be the least invasive. So this is an order from most intense to decreasing intensity. Now, going a little bit further in depth and looking more at the clinical characteristics of anorexia nervosa. So we'll see what's known as lanugo, which is the fine, soft, downy hair growth on the body. Um, this has to do with thermoregulation. Um, you normally see lanugo on babies. So if you've ever put lotion on a baby and it looks like they're, they're covered like in little white peach fuzz all over and you can see it when you put the lotion on them and you're like, oh my goodness, this baby's so hairy. That's lanugo and that's for thermoregulation. You'll also see dry and brittle hair. This is due to protein quality. You may see hyperkeratinemia, which is excessive amounts of keratin in the blood. Cold intolerance with cyanosis, so you'll have the blue fingertips. GI complications, bone loss, protein energy malnutrition with lean body mass loss, and cardiovascular complications. Looking at the clinical characteristics of bulimia nervosa, so again, this may be more difficult to detect depending on severity. So again, we'll have calluses or scarring on the back of the hands known as Russell's signs, enlargement of salivary glands, loss of tooth enamel. So bulimia nervosa is usually uh, detected by a dentist. Symptoms of GERD, esophagitis, sore throat, hematemesis, and Mallory Weiss esophageal tears from purging. Fluid and electrolyte imbalances, constipation, dehydration, alkalosis, and hypokalemia, renal damage, and then symptoms from excessive use of syrup of Ipecac, which is irreversible myocardial damage and possibly sudden death. Now here you can see, so this is kind of just on half of the body, we see binging and purging. And so on half of the body, we see anorexia nervosa. So we see uh, again, the more classic bulimia nervosa display and the more classic anorexia nervosa. And again, you can see the differences um, in physical science as well as lab values. Um, and again, there's some symptoms you'll see in common such as edema, um, but then others right, are, are pretty distinct. So again, the calluses, for example, are very distinct. The cyanosis, right, the turning blue, the poor circulation, more, much more common in anorexia nervosa. Um, the dental and GI symptoms, a little bit more common in bulimia nervosa, et cetera. So looking at psychological management, so long-term goals of psychosocial intervention is to help the patient understand and cooperate with their nutritional and physical rehabilitation, to help patients understand and change their behavior and dysfunctional attitudes related to their eating disorders, to improve interpersonal and social functioning, to address these psychopathologic and psychological conflicts that reinforce or maintain eating disordered behaviors. So again, this is not just, oh, just make them eat better. Now there are there there is a subsect within eating disorder treatments that is much more focused on food intake. Um, again, is it the chicken or the egg? If I eat normally, will the psychological symptoms improve or do the psychological symptoms have to improve for the eating to improve? Um, but that's a little bit beyond the scope um, of this lecture in this class. Now in the acute stage, patients are often negative and obsessive, so it's difficult to conduct formal psychotherapy and therapies more focused on positive behavioral reinforcement and weight restoration. And so once the acute malnutrition has been corrected, the patient's more likely to benefit from more traditional psychotherapy. And again, oftentimes you'll see several types of psychotherapy being performed simultaneously. So the patient will be in family counseling, marital therapy, individual therapy, group therapy, etc. So looking at nutrition and rehabilitation counseling. So nutrition rehabilitation again is focused on our traditional assessment with medical nutrition therapy and then long term you're looking at is counseling and education. So again we're looking at behavior changes. So again we can correct you know the high, the low sodium, the low potassium, we can give supplements like calcium but again Long term, we're looking for behavior changes and improvements in self-management. So things to look for in patients with anorexia nervosa. Again, you're often going to see, of course, a decreased consumption of macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fats. Vegetarianism is often common. Again, what you'll see is that vegetarian diets are naturally low in fat and lower in calories. Inadequate caloric intake, 
limited variety in the diet with poor food group representation. So patients may be very regimented with very specific foods or very specific amounts of foods that they've weighed. So for example, right, it has to be exactly this amount on the food scale of baby carrots and it's baby carrots every day, no changes in vegetables. Severe fluid restriction or excessive fluid intake. Again, it just depends on their current psychological state where again, the fluid makes the scale go up, but consumptions of fluids also decrease hunger. So again, it just depends. You may also notice possibly an excessive amount of artificial sweetener usage. Looking at bulimia nervosa, again, so the patient may have a very chaotic eating. So again, depending on the maybe restricting or binging, depending on if they're making up for or compensating for previous binges. So looking at unpredictable energy intake and 24 hour recalls are not particularly useful. Instead, we're more focused on the number of non-binge days and then binge days to determine the caloric content and really kind of trying to average it out over the week. So if they're binging three days a week and then not binging four days a week, we really want to kind of estimate their total caloric intake for the week. And so, again, this is not super scientific, but just based on our best estimates, right, we estimate that if it's been, if a meal was purged, we're going to account for 50% of those calories. And so diets may appear adequate, but nutrient losses will occur during the purging. So again, you saw that focus on uh, specifically electrolytes that may be deficient. And so again, here you can see some other common um, assessments of eating attitudes, behaviors, and habits, again, of common lines of thinking or behaviors that patients may have. So looking at our lab assessments, so lab abnormalities may not exist until the illness is advanced and visceral protein levels, this is your albumin and prealbumin, will typically be within normal limits, either due to long-term malnutrition or they'll be masked by dehydration. Abnormal lipid profiles are common in bulimia nervosa and low serum glucose results from a deficit of precursors needed for gluconeogenesis and glucose production. So remember that the normal blood glucose is somewhere between 70 to 100. At about 60, you start feeling pretty crummy and woozy. Um, anything right below the 50s, you start to pass out. Um, you know, people will go comatose. I have seen a patient with anorexia nervosa walking and talking and pacing their room with a blood glucose of 27. Most people would be in a coma by then. Um, but again, this is a long-term adaptation that's it's very dangerous. And looking at low T3 syndrome, but again, this should resolve with weight restoration. Looking at vitamin and mineral deficiencies, so hyperkeratinemia is common in anorexia nervosa, and this is attributed to the mobilization of lipid stores and catabolic changes caused by weight loss and metabolic stress. So there's been some documented cases of deficiencies, but overall uncommon. One thing to note is that iron requirements will be decreased in anorexia nervosa due to amenorrhea and hemoglobin may be low due to dehydration or fluid retention. Zinc deficiency may occur secondary to inadequate energy intake, or again, we said the frequency of vegetarianism, so or the avoidance of red meat. And again, vitamin D, calcium and magnesium deficiency may contribute to the degree of bone loss. Looking at fluid and electrolyte balance. So vomiting, laxative and diuretic use can result in significant fluid and electrolyte imbalances, including hypokalemia, alkalosis and hypochloremia. Urine concentration is decreased and urinary output is increased in semi-starvation. And edema may occur in response to malnutrition and refeeding. We also may see a depletion of glycogen and lean tissue, which will be accompanied by the obligatory water loss, which is about three to one. So for every one gram of glycogen loss, you'll see three grams of water. Looking at energy expenditure. So resting energy expenditure is typically low 
in malnourished anorexia nervosa patients. So they'll have weight loss, decreased lean body mass, a long-term energy restriction, and decreased leptin levels. And so what will happen is with adaptive thermogenesis is their metabolic rates will actually significantly decrease. Bulimia nervosa patients often have unpredictable metabolic rates. So depending on how frequent their cycles are of this binging and purging behavior, they may have a slowed metabolic rate if they've been trying to diet and then the binging and purging is a result of being overly restrained. They may have a high metabolic rate as if you binge frequent enough, then what happens is that the metabolic rate will actually increase to some degree. Um, so again, the equations aren't as effective. So baseline though and follow-up assessment of resting energy expenditure may be clinically useful though throughout the course of rehab. So if I can actually do indirect calorimetry and measure the person's metabolic rate, this will give me a much better picture than if I'm looking at equations. Looking at anthropometric assessment. So again, we're looking at skin fold measurements. Again, looking at our body composition with our bioelectrical impedance, our mid arm circumference to actually look at lean body mass and of course our standard height, weight, and BMI. And looking at our restoration of weight, so the rate of weight gain may be affected by hydration status. Again, you're gonna see an initial weight gain with glycogen restoration, metabolic changes, and long-term changes in body composition. And again, that's what that mid-arm circumference and the skin fold lets us determine is if we're actually gaining lean mass or just fat mass. Now looking at medical nutrition therapy and counseling. So anorexia nervosa, so the level of care determined by the severity of malnutrition, the degree of medical and psychiatric instability, duration of illness and growth failure. So again, we said that that formal psychotherapy is not going to be effective when somebody is malnourished. Again, realize that the brain is being deprived of nutrients. So again, it may be some time before this counseling is effective. Looking at bulimia nervosa, Treatment typically begins and continues on an outpatient basis, and inpatient hospitalization is typically uncommon or of short duration. Again, especially if there are cardiac complications from the abuse of syrup of Ipecac or other electrolyte abnormalities. And so here you can just see a sample assessment form. Again, it just goes a little more in depth looking at specific behaviors. So if you'll see in the second column, you'll see that there are behaviors that are more focused on eating disorders, whereas in the left column, it's pretty standard with the exception of body image. Um, it's your pretty standard assessment. So again, looking at our medical treatment, our medical nutrition therapy treatment of anorexia nervosa. So again, weight restoration is essential and may need inpatient supervised weight gain. And this is typically how I would see eating disorder patients is that there was there are there still are two eating disorder clinics in Tallahassee that were residential treatment programs but to qualify for residential treatment programs the patient had to meet a minimum body weight for safety purposes and so when they would go to be admitted if they did not meet admission criteria they were sent to an acute care facility for weight restoration and then they would be discharged to that residential program so that's typically when I saw these patients was when they were in crisis they were very low body weight or they had um, some other electrolyte abnormality or some uh, medical issue that brought them in um, because then they would be discharged to a, a residential treatment program. So the three phases though are going to be weight gain, weight stabilization and prevention of weight loss, and then weight maintenance. And so hospitalized patients are going to gain approximately two to three pounds of weight gain per week. Now realizing that again some of this is going to be fluid, glycogen, right? This is not all just actual tissue increases. Outpatient is going to be a little bit lower at 0.5 to 1 pound of weight gain per week. And then what you'll see is so 30 to 40 calories per kilogram initially with a progressive increase of calories every two to three days. But we only use those aggressive calorie ranges once we've actually made sure the patient's electrolytes are stable as aggressive refeeding of severely malnourished anorexia nervosa patients can lead to refeeding syndrome, um, which just makes the electrolyte problems worse. So once we get them out of that window, which takes about a week, a little bit less, then we can aggressively refeed 
um, and increase caloric intake. Now, beware of patients requiring extremely high energy intakes. Um, so again, sometimes you know you just have to reconcile um, what the patient's reporting versus the indirect calorimetry versus observed behaviors. So again, um, when I would see patients who were still in crisis and they were still having um, severe symptoms, right? They would try and pace in the room. They would pace in the or do body weight exercises in the bathroom to try and burn additional calories. And so sometimes, you know, there's this disconnect between the calories, what, what the what I'm feeding this person and what they should be needing, and if they are or aren't gaining weight. So again, you just kind of have to reconcile all of that. These patients may have a history of extreme avoidance of dietary fat. And so again, though, we may need to slowly incorporate small amounts of fat. Again, we need to make sure that we're getting our essential fatty acids. And this may be in things like salad dressing, mayonnaise, or you know, just individual pats of butter. But again, our goal is to get back to a balanced diet with approximately 30% fat, 15 to 20% protein, and 50 to 55% carbohydrate. But these patients may have delayed gastric emptying with abdominal distension and discomfort after eating. And this is even with regular volumes of food. So what you and I would consider to be a normal volume um, may cause these symptoms in patients who have had severe long-term calorie restrictions. Looking at a multivitamin with calcium and vitamin D, and again, our concern here is looking at that bone loss. Now these patients though, and this is the exception, is that the patient may need a multivitamin without iron. And so we typically think of, right, women of childbearing age always need that additional iron. But if they're still having amenorrhea, then they won't need the additional iron. Now there are commercially available supplements, things like Ensure, Boost, etc. Um, I remember at one point it was um, very in vogue. They were using Luna Bars because, again, there's a lot of marketing for uh, – it's again, it's an energy bar for women, which doesn't really make any sense because – it's food is food, but um, it's more of their marketing campaign. And so I remember the eating disorder clinic would basically use Luna bars and different flavors kind of as um, like pre predetermined snack times um, to at least get this bare minimum intake um, and a little bit better quality nutrition. So inpatients though need to take more responsibility in their meal planning and ordering from the inpatient menu. And so usually the way this works is kind of as the patient progresses, um, there's there's contracts where you know you agree to eat 1,200 calories, and there's a there's a menu of options. And what happens is is you know you you choose foods, and they say you're still low on calories or you're still low on protein. You have to add this, and so you keep selecting foods. And so there's this negotiation process of what foods you eat, but there's still certain thresholds of calories, protein, etc. that have to be met. And nutrition counseling is key both inpatient and outpatient though. Um, but again, so looking at so as you as we decrease our control over their food choices, right, we need to make sure they have the skills to select and plan appropriate meals outside of a residential treatment facility. And again, a, a big focus on cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, are you nervous about it? For example, if you're going to work and there is a Thanksgiving party at work where there's going to be lots of food, what does that do for your anxiety? What are you going to do about it? How do you plan for that, etc. And so here you have some guidelines for medical nutrition therapy for anorexia nervosa. Um, again, it's great. I, I'm glad that there's guidelines, but really this is one of those, if you're really interested in this field, um, I strongly recommend. And so at some point, Professor Kavanaugh will come and, and talk to y'all or um, and look at placements. But this is really one of those you kind of need to be shown the ropes for this type of program, which is how you're going to work with these individuals, what to say, what not to say. Um, again, this is not just read a book. Oh, I know how to be a counselor. That's that's just not how it works. Um, but there is some general guidelines. So looking at medical nutrition therapy for bulimia nervosa. So again, the dietitian needs to assess the patient's tolerance for structure and developing a reasonable plan of controlled eating. The immediate goals are to cease the binging and purging cycle and stabilize body weight. So our first goal is to stop binging and purging. The long-term goal, so again, we said that not all bulimia nervosa patients were overweight. Now, if they are and weight reduction is appropriate, 
then we can have that conversation once we've stopped the binging and purging, and then we can look at healthy weight loss. Um, but that's a much further down the road goal. Um, but again, you may see so 15 to 1600 calories as a reasonable start. Um, but again, if the overly restrictive diet then is what's causing these binging and purging behaviors, we may need to adjust. So patients need encouragement to follow weight maintenance versus constantly being focused on weight loss. And again, looking at our calorie distribution, again, a balanced diet with 25 to 35% of calories from fat, 15 to 20% from protein, and 50 to 55% from carbohydrates. Again, looking at structured meals with three meals and snacks, and then learning again that some feelings of hunger and those hunger cues when they're normal versus abnormal. And again, the, the treatment of choice is typically cognitive behavioral therapy. And so again, the, there's a pretty structured about a 20 week program with three phases, which again, so establishing a regular eating pattern, evaluating changing beliefs about shape and weight, and then focusing on relapse prevention. And so we'll talk more about some of these counseling strategies and just, you know, looking at CBT and looking at the trans theoretical models, etc., more in counseling. And again, here you can see the general guidelines for bulimia nervosa. But again, if this is an area of practice you want to pursue, there are specialty practice groups. And again, you'd want to make sure that you're actually shown the ropes and, and taught by a dietitian who's had significant experience in this area. So looking at nutrition education, so again, we've talked a little bit about counseling and education, where again, we're looking at changing behaviors. Um, but so something, some things to be aware of. So eating disorder patients uh, may appear quite knowledgeable about food and nutrition, um, but often their sources and interpretations may be unreliable. And so again, this is where we can, we can cherry pick studies or we can cherry pick information to say what we wanted to say or to support what we want to do. Malnutrition may impair the patient's ability to process information. So again, remember that when we're in ketosis, one of the things that people will talk about is, uh, and so again, we typically think of nutritionally induced ketosis from a low carbohydrate diet, but ketosis is also induced from low total calorie intake. And one of the things they talk about is quote unquote is being fuzzy or cotton headed, which is your brain likes to work on glucose. With poor nutrition, it is literally more difficult to think and process information. Educational materials also need to be thoroughly assessed to be sure they're appropriate. So again, are they the appropriate um, learning levels? Are they avoiding triggers? Are they using the right terminology? And looking at education, again, may be improved in group settings. So looking at prognosis, so relapse rates are high even after weight restoration and anorexia nervosa, with 50% of patients requiring rehospitalization within one year of inpatient treatment, and two thirds of anorexia nervosa patients have enduring food and weight preoccupation. Um, and so we kind of see this, this breakdown of about threes where one third um, gets completely better, one third has a healthy weight, but they still have some of the psychological symptoms. It's kind of a constant struggle. And then one third um, see minimal improvement. They're constantly um, rehospitalized or back in treatment programs. Um, so adolescents, though, typically have better outcomes than adults. And relapse rates for bulimia nervosa are estimated to be somewhere between 30 to 85 percent. All right, so let's take a look at some practice questions. So if a patient with an eating disorder is compulsive, a perfectionist, and emotionally restrained, and feels ineffective, he or she is likely to have, and this is A, anorexia nervosa. Patients with bulimia nervosa are most likely to be and this is C, within or close to a normal weight range. A clinical sign of bulimia nervosa is, and this is A, erosion of dental enamel. And number four, a common long-term consequence of anorexia nervosa is,
and this is C, osteopenia. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions.